excuse me. <laughs> I cannot stop. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Katie Newman, the Mental Health Services Coordinator for Forsyth County Schools and a co-chair for the Total Wellness Collaborative. And our goal is to mobilize the community of Forsyth to support the growth and success of all learners to lead a balanced and successful life. And as we bring awareness to current um, wellness topics and trends in Forsyth, we also want to validate and normalize the challenges of raising families in today's society. So the TWC really hopes to collaborate with families and professionals in our community to share what resources and opportunities are here in Forsyth and just really a message for hope and encouragement. So I'm here today with um, Dr. Patrick Delaney, and he is a high school teacher here in Forsyth and a mindfulness coach. And also we have Kendra Gilbert, who is a licensed professional counselor and owner of Beyond Today Counseling. Welcome guys, thank you for coming. Thanks. Thanks for having us. So today we're talking about a topic that affects many of our students and parents on how to take care of yourself and, and what self-compassion looks like, kind of cutting yourself some slack. We um, with social media issues and we have a lot of comparison traps out there that sometimes we feel like we're less than or um, we're inadequate in some way and um, so we've just really seen a lot of that and we wanted to kind of talk to you guys about self-care and it seems really simple right <laughs> there are a lot of studies on stress that affect the mind and body and even shorten our lifespan um, with all the demands in our culture, we wanted to hear from you guys um, who've kind of taken on the challenge to help um, yourself and help others in our community. So with all the job losses and illnesses, anxiety, depression, and even suicidal ideation, all of these things that kind of affect our human spirit um, can radically change how we see the world. So I just want to turn and, and first start with you, Kendra, mm -hmm. and just kind of share a little bit about yourself and what you do and um, about the counseling that you've done here in our county. Okay. Um, my name is Kendra Gilbert. I am a licensed professional counselor and owner of Beyond Today Counseling Center. Um, I've been in practice for almost 20 years and um, through that time I've worked with adolescents and um, have seen you know, a, definitely a growing trend of um, increased mental health issues, um, anxiety, stress, you know, family conflict, um, uh, and so, yeah, just have a huge concern, you know, for our um, adolescents and what they're going through on a daily basis. I am a parent as well. I have three daughters. Um, one's a freshman here at North Forsyth, and um, just, you know, have a, a, I guess you would say almost a passion for kids in general to grow up as healthy as they possibly can and to enter their adult years, you know, with, you um, just a sense of confidence that they can handle day-to-day -day stress. They can go to college and handle the stresses of that. They can handle the current stress that they're in if they're in high school and, and dealing with um, academic pressures and social pressures. Um, so you just, you know, you want the best for your kids, but having worked with the adolescents all these years, I just, you know, really strongly okay. have a desire for them to, to be their best selves and to feel good. Okay, thank you. And um, Dr. Delaney, just yes. share us with a little bit about yourself and what you do. Okay, um, I'm Patrick Delaney. I've taught, uh, this is my 20th year teaching high school. Uh, 20s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> um, it's my 18th or 16th year here in Forsyth County. I actually taught at North Forsyth for four years and over at West for 10 years. And then last year I was pulled over to Gateway, which is our alternative school. Mm -hmm. um, kind of what I do now is a little bit different than what I started out doing. And it, it just kind of came to fruition about 10 years ago. I was working on my PhD. Um, I also have two boys and um, we live in Dahlonega so we would drive down and, and I was under a lot of stress and I've always had stress, anxiety as far back as I can remember. Always sh the shy kid and um, just was really stressed out working on my dissertation um, and I kind of had a voice in my head that would just talk all the time like it's time to get up and do this and now you got to do this and what about this and blah blah just kept going all the time. So I went to uh, um, a psychologist and said, look, I've got a voice in my head that goes a million miles an hour. And she said, well, that's a problem, and put me on medication. And a couple months later, I'm like, the voice is still there. It's, it's going. Mm -hmm. So um, I saw she um, I went and saw a counselor with the medication, um, told her. And she's like, yeah, that's weird that you got a voice. I mean, 
driving home, it would just go like, okay, what are you going to do for dinner? And then what's next? And da 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 da. So she said, yeah, we're going to work on that. It didn't help. So um, about two months later, she just, um, she, her family picked up and moved. So when I was working on my dissertation, um, my dissertation was how the brain develops in the first five years of life. Mm -hmm. And I just came across mindfulness and meditation and how the brain can be changed and help with stress, anxiety, and all, all of that. So I looked for a counselor, um, but then I Googled counselor, my area, mindfulness next to it. Mm -hmm. And I found a, a counselor and I went to her and said, look, I've got a voice. I don't know if I'm supposed to be in a checked in somewhere, <laughs> but it just goes sure. all the time. And she said, okay, well, what's the problem? And I said, I remember distinctly saying, maybe you don't understand. I've got a voice in my head. I'm walking down my hall at school. It's talking to me like, make sure you're not embarrassing yourself and smile and you know, give me all these directions. And she said, maybe you don't understand. Everybody has that voice. Mm. And that was like a, a big aha moment because wow. I thought I was the one with the voice in my head and you guys were just going through life just blank and enjoying and talking <laughs> and everything was sure. fine. So um, she taught me mindfulness and meditation and it was about a year, two years, and it helped me so much. Um, I got off medication and it was just like a big breath. It was just a big release. Um, as, a as a special education teacher, I spent a lot of time in meetings and the teachers and the parents and would come into these meetings and the students would just say, I'm so stressed out. Mm -hmm. It's awful. And uh, and I heard their story, heard my story in them. And uh, at that point, I went to my administration and said, look, what do you think about having me teach mindfulness and meditation to our classes? Um, and this was about eight years ago. And they're like, well, shoot, yeah, let's do it. So we found the most stressed, most anxious kids that we could. And I taught them um, once a day, collected data. They would take a survey, depression, anxiety, stress survey, and we would meditate and also teach them how the brain works and, and the different chemicals that flow through your brain and all of that. And, and I would also just collect all the um, data just to, just to make sure what we were doing was, was working. And the data came back, it was amazing. I mean, just like it had helped me, <coughs> excuse me, it had helped them and I was blown away and administration was blown away. So we kind of opened the program um, and then my students were, we were doing research on mindfulness and meditation. We found the Seattle Seahawks, Chicago Bulls, all these sports teams were using it. So I went to our head football coach and said, hey, what do you think? And he's like, all right, let's try it. So had 120 football players li line out before wow. a game and, um, you know, I'd walk them through a body scan. And then once a week, I would teach them mindfulness and meditation, how the brain works and how stress works. And it blew up from the football team to the girls' basketball team. And we went to the Final Four, and then the golf team, and then lacrosse. So that just kind of kept growing and growing. Uh, then I taught classes to my colleagues, my fellow teachers after school. I had a co-teacher that I worked with, and she, you know, I taught her, and she and I both went to Atlanta Mindfulness Institute and um, studied more on mindfulness. And then it just got so big that we had requests from the community, so we started teaching classes out in the community. So at this point, um, as of last year, Drew Hayes, the principal over Gateway, heard what I was doing and he called me over and said, I mm -hmm. want you to come over here. So I went over there and um, so now I'm working with the students at the alternative school and we, we, I, I teach them mindfulness and meditation every day. We sit for 10 minutes and follow our breath and we learn about stress. and. Um, so I do that during the day. I've got clients I work with one-on-one. -on -one. I've got basketball and football teams that have called me over. Um, and then on the weekends I work, my, my business partner, I work at Decision Point Wellness with people struggling with addiction, uh, addiction to substance abuse. So their program, we come in once a week and their program um, is an eight-week program just like ours is. So they meet with us once a week and we teach them mindfulness and meditation. And, Hearing them say, you know, if it wasn't for that, I would have used is just amazing. It's, it's, it's awesome. It's yeah, huge. and hearing my kids go, you know what, Doc, I, I didn't get mad or I, my stress, I feel so much better. It's like, it's like a magic pill of sorts. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm doing right now. That's awesome. That's Thanks. awesome. Now, Kendra, do you see, um, what are some other issues that you see in adolescents that, you know, mindfulness and some self-care could help with? I mean, what are some trends that you kind of see with students? 
Well, anxiety for sure, for sure. I mean, there's, um, I would say the majority of kids suffer from some form of anxiety, um, whether it's a disorder, you know, quote or not, but I think most kids that come in have some form of anxiety disorder. Self-harm is another um, ongoing condition that we see often. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think by the time, what I've noticed as a trend is, is children who suffer from anxiety or, you know, early in their childhood, um, pre-teen years, by the time they're 16, 17, 18, they're starting to suffer from depression. And that's a concern because, you know, once you start to suffer from depression, it just becomes a bigger animal to try to, to fight with. Um, so what Dr. Delaney is doing is it's really powerful. It's a, it's a tool that anyone can use. It's fairly simple and easy. Mm -hmm. It just takes, you know, some practice. and. So I think teaching that from early age would be so helpful for so many to, um, to fight with the anxiety. Sure, and I know that um, when we've, in addition to um, Dr. Um, well, uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who mm -hmm. kind of secularized mindfulness, mm -hmm. there are other research that shows that the busier we are, the less time we have to process those events in our life in between the events. Right. So when students like go to bed and they go to sleep, they go into that REM sleep and they file away those memories, mm -hmm. they kind of chain together on how they, what they believe about those events. Mm -hmm. right. And so we oftentimes, the busier we are, the more noise that kind of clouds us. Mm -hmm. And there's a great picture um, of a, a person with their mind full Mm -hmm. with a bunch of jumble and then mindful <coughs> being mindful of, of exactly you know what what um, what's going on mm -hmm. um, so would you share a little bit about the relationship with self um, I know that that in just the belief about yourself and how that can impact being mindful and sure well I think you know we all have you thought about a voice and, and mm -hmm. I'm so glad that someone acknowledged that everyone has this voice um, it, and there's a term that we use sometimes called the internal critic and the internal credit is the voice inside your head that says you need to try harder, you need to do more. Um, what if you don't study for that test, you're gonna fail. The credit, I think its job, if, you, if it has a, a purpose, is to keep us in line, you know, to keep us from making mistakes or keep us from um, doing things that might cause us, you know, to be, you know, uh, uh, maybe upset our parents or uh, upset ourselves. But unfortunately, this critic can be a bully at times. It can um, just taunt us and not leave us alone and never let us get a break. Wow. And so we have to, uh, you know, take a moment to stop and realize, like, what all is going on? What all, what all is being said in my head that isn't completely accurate, isn't true, um, that's just a little too much, you know? And so there's an exercise that we use sometimes where we take um, ourselves as the observer of the critic in our head and also the um, one being criticized because there are there is both there is the critic that tells us you know do more be more there's also the wounded self that is hearing all of this and feeling guilty and feeling not good enough and so if you take almost a third stance of noticing this dialogue between the two then um, and this is kind of a mindful exercise um, that you're slowing down just one to be aware of, of this dialogue but, um, but you're also giving yourself permission to speak into both of those um, voices. So you can maybe acknowledge the critic is maybe trying to keep you in line, trying to do what's best for you, but he's being a bully or she's being a bully. And then also the wounded self is really hurting and, and, and being affected by what this critic is saying every day. And so it gives you permission to actually make a, make a new choice or a new perspective on what do you want to think going forward about whatever circumstance it is. I mean, if it's academics or a social, you know, friend situation, you know, do I want to just listen to the critic and not ever have a voice myself? Or do I want to have a different perspective and cut myself some slack, um, give myself a break that I am doing the best that I can and I'm trying really hard. And I think that's the voice that we don't listen to very often and that we don't allow, you know, enough time in our, in our heads to, to hear, to say, you know what, I'm actually doing pretty good. You know, why, why don't I take a minute and, and acknowledge the accomplishments I've made today or this week instead of focusing on what I haven't done or what I've got to do in the future. Um, and that's an, actually another powerful exercise that we do sometimes is list out some of the things that you've done this today or yesterday or this week and just take a minute and just go through them and, not, and acknowledge to yourself, hey, I did that, I mastered that, I completed that task or, you know what, that was really fun. I really enjoyed hanging out with that person or, um, going to that restaurant that was actually a fun activity and instead of constantly looking forward and, and worrying about what we have to do in the future that we take time to look back and give ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back and said you know what I actually did a pretty good job there we and we do get in that pain cycle right mm -hmm. we we see a lot of parents and 
and even students that will get in this cycle of um, patterns that I think this or I have these things that have happened, I, I kind of view them as in, in the critic that mm -hmm. you're saying, right. um, in a critical lens, and then it, it, also, it gets us in that rejection mm -hmm. mode, the rejection sensitivity, so we're, we're even hypersensitive to that if we're looking for it, right? Mm -hmm. And then we continue that cycle of feeling rejected. That's going to skew how we feel about ourselves. Sure. And, um, and uh, Dr. Delaney, mm -hmm. we, would you mind sharing, too, about um, kind of uh, the secular, sec, I don't even know how to say it, the secular, secular part of mindfulness and how that came to kind of our what, the Western front, so to speak, and just kind of explain a little bit about maybe more what it is exactly mm -hmm. so people have a better understanding because that's a like you said earlier that's it, this is very popular now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it was um, originally was brought over from the east by um, dr. John Cabot Zinn um, what he did is he was over there studying and he came he worked at um, UMass I mm -hmm. believe and he was working with pa patients who um, were going through cancer chemotherapy so um, he had learned mindfulness and meditation over there. He brought it here, stripped out all the religious aspects, and taught these folks who were um, really going through the toughest part of their life, facing death and, and pain of chemotherapy, mindfulness and meditation, not to take the pain away, but it, you can kind of look at it in two different parts. There's the pain, but there's the suffering that is that. The pain is the physical pain. The suffering is kind of what you were saying, the story that's attached to that. So right. um, in their case, it was, I'm going through chemotherapy, I'm going to, you know, I, I might pass away, I'm going to leave my family. It's all that worry. And so what mindfulness does is it kind of separates the pain and the suffering. So when he taught that and it worked so well, then it kind of spread with stress and anxiety. And, and what the, the misconception is that um, if you're mindful and you're meditating, you're sitting there with a clear and empty mind. And it's, you know, it's the pictures we see uh, on Time Magazine of the blonde with her, you know, in the, the lotus position and it's serene. Where it's not, I mean, it's meditation and mindfulness is a practice and it's, it's not easy. Um, but the results uh, are so beneficial that um, it's just tremendous. And you wouldn't think by sitting and following your breath that that can help you so much, but that's basically what you do. You sit, you close your eyes, you notice your breath, and then there's a couple things that are going to tip off, like you'll want to move, but you don't move. Or you'll hear a sound, and your mind will want to go to that sound, and you just come back to your breath. Um, then you'll, you'll be following your breath, and a thought will come up. What am I going to do for dinner? Why am I sitting here? This is ridiculous. What you do is you notice that your mind has wandered, and you come back to your breath. Basically what that does is that's like doing a bicep curl for your brain. So every time your mind wanders and you bring it back, that's a win. That's a good thing. So you're strengthening that part of your brain um, that can focus, that can be in this moment versus down the road or down the rabbit hole with a test or quiz, or if I don't pass this, I'm not going to college, I don't go to college. So you're practicing sitting for maybe five minutes a day, doing that lifting with your brain, and you're strengthening that part of the brain um, that we can use as soon as your mind starts to go off on that path of, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong, blah, blah, blah. You notice it and you can come back. So that's the practice and then it works in the daily life of, oh, there goes my mind again. Yeah, there he is. He's back and he's not being nice and he's <laughs> saying, you know, mean things to me or he's judging everybody else. So come back to my breath and then he'll wander off again and it's just, it's just like a gym workout it's over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. So what John Kabat-Zinn did was he built this mindfulness-based stress, stress reduction, pulled out all the uh, religious overtones and it's just simply calls it simple secular and scientifically proven and the research out there is just amazing I mean you wouldn't think sitting and following your breath is anything but when you actually dig into the research and that's what my students I do it you can learn how the brain is actually being changed sure. over eight weeks so my program that my kids go through is an eight-week program because when they put somebody through a um, fMRI or a, a, a brain imaging um, computer they can see after eight weeks that the brain has changed and that's why we go eight weeks so I teach meditation and they sit you know that full eight weeks because that's how I know them actually making a difference yeah and we and we've oh, there's like the Buddha brain book and mm -hmm. then there's the um, uh, the um, 
the whole child or the the mind based child mm -hmm. um, book that talk about how the neurological connections actually help us um, from flipping our lid, so to speak, right. um, it, where we don't get into the fight, flight, or freeze, right. which triggers the hippocampus and then the amygdala, mm -hmm. which which sets off all sorts of hormones. Right. And we have seen a great difference in the like the adrenal fatigue that a lot of adults sure. and students have where our bodies are just constantly um, requiring that stress hormone to be triggered. And so the more mindful we are without judgment, and I think that's an important yes, part of definitely. John Kabat-Zinn, is observing those thoughts and not going to the mm -hmm. critic or even the victim, but just observing. You know, my mind wandered. I'm observing it to come back, but without saying, wow, I can't do this, and mindfulness is hard, and right. without getting into that self-critic mm -hmm. um, that Kendra talked about. It was just huge. So what have your students said um, in relationship to like how, how that's maybe helped them and what areas has it benefited? Well, it, it all depends where they're at, you know, what they're struggling with. It's what's interesting about mindfulness meditation is it, it helps each person in a different way, I guess. So if you're struggling with stress, then that's kind of what they're focused on. Um, and, and so when we take the stress test, they can see that their stress has gone down or they can mm -hmm. see that oh yeah, I was getting ready for that test and instead of worrying and, and freaking out, I just took a breath and relaxed and I'm here, I'm in this moment, I've studied, this is the best I can do, I'm gonna do it. Um, like when I work with football players or golfers, instead of getting angry after a shot or upset with the ref um, and then losing those seconds, the team can go faster, team can move forward. So instead of I, I took a shot and I missed and oh, darn, there you go, now my parents are watching, coach is watching, it's I missed, move on. So it's just a continuous moving on. So it all depends who I'm working with. Um, my students in particular are, are like all of our students. They're just, they have a lot of things going on. And I think if my mind is going a million miles an hour, I know theirs is going because they have um, stress and anxiety and tests and parents and college and it's all of this. So after, you know, after the first week or two where they're going, why am I sitting here doing this? And then after week three, they're like, boy, you know, I kind of feel a little bit better. I don't know what it is, but mom or dad said, What's, what are you doing? You're kind of relaxed. Is everything okay? So it just kind of slowly works its way in where you can feel better. But it is a practice. I mean, it's, it's, there's, no, um, there's no end of the road. There's, it's something you have to do every day. Um, it, it, it's not going to make everything unicorns and rainbows. It's, it's just a little bit better, you know? Mm -hmm. It makes things a little bit easier, um, but it's a practice that, that when I teach them, when they leave or they'll come back to me next year, they're like, you know what? I'm still meditating. I'm still doing mindfulness because it's a practice they have to, mm -hmm. you have to keep working on because that voice in your head has been there your whole life right. and he's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you don't need to fight him. It's just noticing him mm -hmm. and noticing that that voice isn't me. Um, he may be there to protect me, but right now, uh, I'm okay. I don't need that. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And that's kind of what you were talking mm -hmm. about, what we what we yeah. do in cognitive behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. Would you mind sharing a little bit about, um, like, what we do with that? And um, because we do look at, um, you know, that core belief, and, mm -hmm. and like Dr. Delaney said, that it's always been with us. Can you mm -hmm. just speak a little bit about what that, yes. what that looks like? Well, cognitive behavioral therapy is basically your cognitions, your thoughts, and then behavioral therapy being how it, you exhibit your, your emotions and your behavior. Um, you can change how you feel either by changing your thoughts or changing your behavior. You can't just decide you're gonna feel better. I wish we could, but you know, <laughs> um, you may really want to, but it does require um, recognizing what you're thinking, like what's going on in your head, and your reoccurring thoughts, um, what we call automatic thoughts or something that are more or less a clue to what's going on really underneath, like you're saying about your core belief. So when you start to trace your automatic thoughts and if they, you know, are mostly negative or critical, then you start to unwind that and you realize that, you know, probably down deep inside somewhere, I, I don't feel good enough. And it's showing up in these different ways. It's showing up in um, stress and anxiety. The, there's the emotional part, but it's also showing up in what, I, you know, what I'm saying to myself. I'm saying, you know, I'm, I better I better study harder. I'm, I'm going to fail, and if I fail, I'm not going to go to a good college. You know, all these things that are just constantly rolling through your mind. And so, when you take this moment of just stopping for a second and, and recognizing what you're thinking, 
then you have the opportunity to decide, is this a good thought for me? Is this helping me? Or can I change it? Is it, and is it always true? You know, because sometimes we state things in our heads as other facts, but maybe they're half truths. And, you know, just as much as you may um, struggle to pass math, and maybe you also ace, you know, history or, you know, so um, if passing and failing are both equal, then you're not always failing, right? You're, all, you're actually, you know, 50% failing, 50% passing, but it's, that's not the voice we listen to. We listen to the voice that says, oh, you're going to fail, you're going to fail. And so um, sometimes we fight those, we, ha we need to fight those thoughts and challenge them that they're not 100% accurate. And if there's any exception to your quote unquote rule about yourself or about your situation, then it's, it's not a fact. And so that, just challenging those thoughts that way can be helpful for some. Behaviorally, it's doing things differently. Like if you notice yourself, you know, withdrawing from your family or spending too much time on your um, device or something like that as a way of coping, then that could be just a manifestation of, you know, what's going on emotionally. So by changing that behavior, then it, you know, then it kind of forces you to deal with your emotions in a different way and, and unravel again maybe what's going on on the inside. So that's that's where CBT is, is a helpful practice. Um, I think journaling actually is probably the best way to, to go about um, you know implementing some CBT into your life where you're you know journaling out your thoughts and your feelings and then on paper you'll start to see you know what's going on on the inside and then that allow you maybe to challenge your own thoughts. And um, I think the cool thing about journaling too is that I th naturally as you're writing you'll want to meander through what you're thinking and feeling to a potential solution and so you'll see yourself you know initially stating just how you feel and being raw about it and then by the time you finish you'll start to kind of come up with a plan of like what you know what you're going to do about how you're feeling so um, that's a great tip I would recommend I would recommend yeah journaling to work yeah, on yeah. CBT and I know that I've had a lot of questions too um, in my role um, about I know that Dr. Delaney you spoke about um, the science behind um, you know and there's science you know research with CBT mm -hmm. too um, but looking at those those um, tools is what we like to call more mod modalities in the therapeutic world um, but sharing too that um, it doesn't mean that an individual can't practice their own religious beliefs mm -hmm. um, and, in, and <coughs> in addition to these tools and these practices and so we, I have had some discussion with some individuals about that mm -hmm. and just reassuring them that this, is, this isn't this is um, something that replaces that by any means. Would right. you both agree to that? Definitely. It's it's kind of has that stigma uh, attached to it um, until you look into it and see that it, that it, it has n no religious overtones. Um, and every if you think every religion kind of does have their own sort of mm -hmm. prayer or practice or sitting, it's the same thing. So um, what mindfulness meditation does, it makes you a better whatever you are, a better Christian or a better Buddhist or whatever. It just, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't have any religiousness in, included into it. Um, and I think that's just because we have a lack of, you know, we, we have a lack of understanding. What I have noticed is that my high school students, um, they don't have that, they don't have that view of it. And maybe it's because I'm older and I, you know, um, I'm not that old, but I remember, you know, the 70s and I remember seeing that on the news and that kind of stuff where it was kind of hippie and woo-woo and weird. And, um, but my, my students have, don't have that view. I mean, they, they, they'll come in now and we sit and they, they don't even bring up, is this religious? Is this, they, they don't, they're so open. They're just like, oh, this is going to help me with stress and anxiety. Yeah, I want to, mm -hmm. I want to do it. And they'll sit down. They've grown up with essential oils <coughs> <Right, laughs> going on in their house. No, yeah, yeah exactly. So <laughs> they'll come in and, um, you know, at, at Gateway, we have new students come in periodically. And I had um, my class, you know, came in, we had a new student and he knew someone in the class and, and he said, well, what are we doing? Because I have chairs that we sit on, kind of comfy chairs when we meditate and the other student was like, oh, we meditate. Come on, sit down. This is just what we do. And, you know, that's how we start our class every day. So um, there's no religious aspect. It, it's all science. Nowadays, it's just all science. And the latest research I've read was th they looked inside someone's brain and were trying to figure out, you know, where mindfulness and meditation was taking place, what it was making stronger. It, it makes the frontal lobe and the amygdala a little bit stronger in connection. Right. But what it really does is it turns off 
that internal critic a little bit. So mm. whenever we're not in the zone or focused or studying or really into music, then that part, it's called the default mode network, it starts to spin and starts to think about me and my mm. ego and oh, this is what I should do and then this is what I need to do and it just goes and goes and then we get caught up and then we get anxious and stressed. So what mindfulness does, it kind of allows you to notice that and bring yourself back to, oh, here I go, mm. this is, the, I don't need to go, I don't need to go down that rabbit hole, mm. I'm okay. Without, it's almost like without fear. And, right. and, and fear drives <coughs> a lot of our behaviors these days. Um, even parenting, I know mm -hmm. that parenting is a huge um, uh, concern. A lot of parents have issues with, am I doing the right thing, am I not? And that fear is driving that, yeah. right? So we've gone from a fear of um, missing out um, parenting mm -hmm. to fear of messing up. FOMO instead right. of FOMO and um, like fear of messing up and so we kind of retreat and and it causes a lot more anxiety when we're paralyzed and not able to do not really wanting to put ourselves out there right. too and that affects confidence levels mm -hmm. um, and we we have issues with confidence with our students I know as a um, Gen Xer like um, we had our our generation was identified as um, high arrogance and low self-esteem and therefore the grunge phase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if y'all remember that. Um, the grunge uh, phase was there. Um, but we're looking at a generation that, that has some similar um, behaviors because they, they ha their generation of choice mm -hmm. and they have access to information at their fingertips at any time, any, any part of the day. So it kind of removes that um, the, the forced choices that we that, mm -hmm. that more of us used to have to make when they don't have those forced choices because they have a lot of information um, and, and even resources at their fingertips. So um, that tends to be something that we that, that drives confidence is those overcoming those struggles, mm -hmm. right? And we've seen that. We, we've seen a lot of that those issues of not overcoming those obstacles and even kind of mending the you know or or even removing the obstacle from our students and that's not a solution really either right because we kind of right. have to go through that in our mind mm -hmm. um, well Kendra last thing um, I just wanted to see if um, just any last tips or comments that you would say um, would it help people if, if, I, if I were to ask you what would help me be the healthiest self I could be um, what would what would you say just coming from what you do as a you know professional, what you do as a mom mm -hmm. um, of three girls, what would you say would well, be helpful? Probably sounds cliche, but I would say you know be good to yourself, you know take care, take good care of you, um, and make sure you're spending or setting time aside to do that. Um, if you're a parent, then you know I know it's busy. I, I live it every day. You know you get up early, you run all day. You, you know don't stop until you fall into the bed, but um, but carve out some time in your in your day in your life to just to you know practice mindfulness or to um, just do nothing <laughs> you know and not have something on the schedule um, and and for families too I think we are such a busy society and all these you know all of our opportunities I think about um, how much things have changed um, over the, the past generations you both were kind of alluding into that. Um, my mom is 80 and I think about how she grew up versus how my kids are growing up and it's so different. Um, and we have so many much more opportunities, but I think that temptation to be involved in everything, you know, is part of what is, is stressing us out and causing us increased anxiety and, and increased overwhelm and just being tired. And so um, I would just encourage, you know, kids and families to, to slow down and to take a breath and, um, and just enjoy the moment every now and then and, and, and practice gratitude. I would just be thankful for the little things that you have and instead of always, you know, striving for the next thing. Um, but you know, more or less, just practice some good self-care, and um, and make that a priority to take care of yourself, and and you know, so you can take care of other people and all you have on your plate. Sure. Yeah, the flight attendant model. <laughs> yeah. Take care of yourself. Yeah. Okay. And then, Dr. Delaney, would there be any helpful tips or anything that you would kind of share? Um, I, I I agree totally with what she's saying. You know, just slowing down, being being in the moment, because there's really. I mean, this is the moment that we have right in front of us right now. There's no happiness in the future, happiness in the past. It just is what it is right now. So if we're caught up and stressed or, you know, so involved in our phones and just next and next and next, what if there is no next? What if this is it? Mm 
Mm. You know, this is so this moment. So, um, you know, because I'm into the mindfulness and meditation, that's what I would suggest is that maybe, you know, folks, students, anybody might want to look into it um, and find a teacher that, that is certified that you can go to. Um, or, you know, figure out where someone that you know and, and get a recommendation where you can find an eight-week course where um, it's a real mindfulness and meditation course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, practicing that every day. Yeah, and practicing every day. Yeah. Would you say there are any, uh, like, apps or websites or resources um, that would be helpful? Well, my website is the North Georgia Mindfulness Project, um, so you can find a lot of information there. Um, I'd use apps. We talked about Headspace and, some, and Stop, Breathe, and Think is a really good one. Mm -hmm. The only problem that I have with apps is I believe that there's a no, that it's an app on meditation, but you're not understanding why I'm using this app mm. and how it's working. If you if you learn why it, you're doing it and how it's working and how it helps, then the app can help you. But just to click okay. on Headspace and have him walk you through a meditation, you may feel relaxed or better. But if you don't really know why it's it's probably not going to stick. That understanding, right? Yeah, you don't have an understanding. understanding. So mm -hmm. that's you have to have that. It's just like any other, any anything else you learn. You got to have that base, and then you can jump onto the apps. And and there's a lot of there's a ton of them out there. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you both for being Thanks. here today, and mm -hmm. thank you all for listening in. And we hope that you have a happy and mindful holiday season. We'd like to thank United Way and North Forsyth High School AV Tech and Film Class for their contribution to this podcast. The views in this forum are from the individuals of the collaborative panel and are for community discussion purposes only. To view Forsyth County Schools' disclaimer, go to www.forsyth.k12.ga.us forward slash disclaimer.